What's up, Navigating Academia family? This is your buddy and personal academic mentor, Dr. J. Phoenix Singh, coming at you to be able to answer a valued viewer's question. Today's question comes from Yugi. So big shout out and lots of love to Yugi. Thank you so much for your question. I always love hearing from you guys, especially about anything you want me to make videos on. Please place your questions down here and your video requests in the comments below. I love to hear from you. Even if you just enjoyed the video, let me know. Really motivating for me. So Yuki's question was posted on a video called Do This Now If Applying to a Clinical Psychology PhD program this year. But this answer, I try to make it relevant to people in any field uh, where research is involved. So here's Yuki's question. I was wondering if you could do a video on getting a research assistantship. I'm a fourth year undergrad and I recently changed career directions away from clinical psych and was thinking of taking a year or two to do research work or applied work. So in general, advice on that too. So you can, let's go ahead and talk about this in two different ways. The first is how to be able to get a research assistant position in whatever your new desired field is. And then we'll talk about getting practical experience as well. Uh, in terms of getting research experience, if you see me looking up here, it's just because I made some preliminary notes for us for this video. So when I'm taking a look up there, that's basically what I am doing. Okay, so in terms of getting a research assistantship, the key thing is to be able to think about uh, not just what you want now, but also where you want to be. You know, do you want to get into a master's program, a doctoral program in a different field? And if so, do you already have a pretty strong idea of the particular area of research or practice that you want to be in. So when it comes to a research assistantship, I want you thinking about the demographic, the methodology, and the phenomenon that you're most interested in exploring further in graduate school. Why? Because the name of the game here, Yuki, is uh, a consistent narrative. So for example, if let's say you've got a pretty strong concept of what you want to do in graduate school, um, let's say that you know, you're really into computer science, right? Like that's your thing. That's where you want to shift away from clinical psych to be able to explore. But of course, you're doing a research assistantship on something you know, completely different and totally different kind of lab. We wouldn't want to do that. But even within ComSci, there's obviously so many different subfields. And if the subfield that you're engaged in, in terms of your lab work, is phenomenally different right, than the sector that you want to be in, especially because right now you're not already in a lab, you're trying to choose one, right? try to choose one that has the best goodness of fit possible in case that's super important. Um, so how are you going to find these labs? Well, if you're still an undergraduate, obviously you'd want to go to the relevant department. Um, right now, if you're a fourth year undergrad, and what I'm making this video for you, the semester has not yet started in terms of the fall. And this is great because it gives you a chance right now as fast as possible to be able to reach out to whoever the head or co-heads of a given lab uh, are to be able to ask them what opportunities are there to be able to become a volunteer research assistant. This is really important that you get in touch with them as fast as possible because even right now they may not have any positions available, uh, but at least you're going to be on their radar if anything does actually open it up. And you should tell them that you're interested in case anything does open up if they're currently packed. Um, ideally, you would go and see them in person after contacting them via email. You can see the lab, you can meet other people who are there, um, you can talk with other individuals who are there about their experiences in the lab, and most importantly, you can sit down with usually, not necessarily the professor, but with the lab manager. Um, and this is somebody who's usually paid, usually they've gone to undergraduate, and they're kind of uh, in this uh, this purgatory, and we'll talk more about this in a second, uh, in terms of being in between undergraduate and graduate studies, usually. Uh, or they completed a master's, but they need more experience before applying to a doctoral program, or they want to be an internal candidate for that university um, where they're a lab manager, whatever it happens to be, they're there, it's a paid position, and that's the individual who's going to provide, be providing you likely with more supervision than the professor. The likelihood is exceptionally high. Okay. There may also be other people in, the, uh, in that lab who are you know, advanced doctoral students or even postdoctoral fellows who would be supervising you. So don't think that just because a you know, professor is the official head of the lab that necessarily you're going to be seeing them a ton. And even when it comes to getting a letter of recommendation, usually those letters of recommendation are going to be uh, drafted by, if not kind of like finalized by, and then just kind of signed by whoever the lab manager is or whoever that supervising grad student or postdoctoral fellow are. So you should just know that that's kind of the name of the game here is you don't just want to kind of get in good with the professor, but also with these other more senior individuals who are going to be in that lab. So contact them, reach out. Hopefully you can visit in person. You can also take a look at whether or not your university even offers any kind of elective credits. So for example, an independent study credit. Um, and even though these things are usually pass-fail, 
more credit's never a bad thing, especially if you don't have to pay additional money to be able to do that kind of, uh, that kind of credit. Um, fantastic, right? Shows up on the, uh, on the resume. So that's what I would say. It's really important when you do meet with these people, though, that you be really transparent. That's my second point um, about what you're looking for, not just in terms of a, you know, a general research assistantship, but what do you want to learn? Again, maybe there's a specific methodology you want to learn. Maybe you want to get specific kinds of experience while you're there. Maybe you're not really confident with stats and you want to learn more about statistical analysis. Maybe you're not really comfortable with methodological design or with the ethics board approval, so IRB approval. Fabulous. These are things that you can learn, especially because you're newer to the field. Now, I wouldn't necessarily really push the fact that you're new in terms of you know wanting to, to make kind of a change in your education. I wouldn't really push that when you're actually speaking with these folks. Um, but I would definitely, you know, convey how this is a, a real passion for you and that the interest where it has evolved from. Know your own narrative when you're speaking with them. And when I say be transparent about your outcomes, not just skill sets, but also things like if you're looking for a letter of recommendation, if you're looking for the opportunity to present at a local, a regional, a national, and international conference, which if you want to get into a doctoral program or a master's program for that matter, it's going to help you a ton, right? So just try to get a conference poster or a conference paper opportunity at a recognized national conference that has enough of the name cachet so that people will be like, yo, this is good, right? We know that conference. It's, a, again, a name in the field. It's the McDonald's conference, as I would call it, right, insofar as people knowing that brand. So, for example, in my field, it's APLS and IFMHS. You may be like, don't just think that's like alphabet soup. APLS is Division 41 of the American Psychological Association. There's forensic psychologists like myself. IAFMHS is the International Association of Forensic Mental Health Services, and that's kind of more of the global conference. And these are, you know, two of many conferences, but again, these are kind of the McDonald's brand conferences, so good to know. Um, also, if you can get on a peer-reviewed publication, this is the rarest possible thing, um, especially to be able to do within one year. It's highly unlikely. Usually it would be something with would be your second year in a lab. Again, not always, but, you know, it'd be very rare uh, for an undergraduate within one year to be able to have the opportunity to be able to get on a publication. Um, but it's a massive differentiator. Um, you know, less than 10% of applicants for, for even top programs are going to have, you know, one or more publications. Some programs, uh, people will be bonkers in terms of the number of pubs they have. I recently worked with an amazing uh, student, and if you ever want to work with me, obviously my you know, link is below here. You can go ahead and set up a session with me. We can talk about your unique case. Um, but it's one of these situations where she had over 20 publications and good publications. She also had seven research assistant positions at the same time. It made no sense. She was phenomenal, right? And, you know, so it's one of these things, I mean, for psyche, you know, people need to know that they're applying against people like that, right? Uh, which is insane, but those people do exist out there and they're applying to top programs, which is why you need to really be competitive in terms of your CV, you know, what's on there. And, uh, you know, for me, I always try to come up with a battle plan for with, uh, with people about how to be able to do this. The final thing that I want to say on this, Yuki, is that after graduation, it's going to be really hard to get a research assistant position. And I want you to know that. Why? Because these are volunteer, unpaid positions almost always. And after you graduate, if you were to go to somebody, even at your alma mater, right, where you're going to be graduating from, and you go to the, somebody in the department, you say, oh my gosh, you should have done this as an undergrad, but I'm so passionate now. Can I get a volunteer position? I'll work for free. The thing is, is that if other undergraduates or like current undergraduates at the school, if they want to do it, they, they are obligated to give the undergraduates who are currently enrolled those positions, okay? Uh, just like if somebody in you know, that position were to come when you're still an undergraduate here in your final year, you'd expect them to give you the opportunity. It's the same thing. And because of that, a lot of people struggle deeply as people who want to kind of shift careers to be able to get these research assistant positions. Um, if you are in that, in that boat, you're watching this video and you are a career changer, um, or maybe just, you know, you didn't have your ish together undergraduate, now you want to shift into, into a, a different field and get a research assistant position. Um, you know, get, becoming a lab manager at your target institution, right, uh, with your target supervisor even, uh, would be a phenomenal opportunity. You'll become an internal candidate. Yes, you're going to basically, uh, you know, be working there for not a lot of money at all for a couple of years. Um, but if you can do it, the odds of you getting accepted into that program are astronomically high compared to individuals with the same kind of a background who, in terms of your know, lack of research experience at the time, uh, who are kind of, you know, applying to that program fresh. 
especially the same supervisor, because by that point, you're going to know, like, and trust the target supervisor. They will know, like, and trust you. And they don't want to train an entirely new person to do all the protocols that you already know exactly how to do. So even if you have a really bad GPA, uh, or even if you're somebody who does not have any research experience and so forth, that's a great option for you. And you can take a look at um, you know, different job posting uh, you know, uh, job boards, you can take a look and even post on uh, you know, LinkedIn on specific groups that are for this new field that you're interested in getting into. And oftentimes associations that have membership directories also have some sort of a listserv. And so you can say, you know, talk about how interested you are, have a link to your CV. If they don't allow attachments, just upload it online and then get a URL right for that that links to that file and then put the URL on there that usually will get through the firewalls. So that's the advice that I've got on this. But thank you so much, Yuki, for your question. I really appreciate it. Lots of love to all of you. Please do comment below, even just to be able to give me some motivation. Love you guys. I really appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Peace.